Um, when we think about what causes mental health needs, there's no one group of, you know, a predisposing factors. But what I like to remember is even the person with mental health problems was doing well last year or last month or one year before. So it's a concept that once your level of stress outstrips your ability to cope, then you, you know, develop a mental health diagnosis. And um, when multiple things get stressed, uh, uh, everyday black man, mm -hmm. I try to stay away from the concept of the black man as one mother of uh, one style of thing. But there are some things that we can agree on. If we agree that black men are the requisite for um, the tapestry that the community, then it's necessary to address what looks like um, a silent epidemic, which is when a black man um, is diagnosed with a mental health diagnosis. It's more than that man. It becomes the significant order, the children, the school workers, the community. And if we are to address the concept of um, inequities in racial wealth, you know, I think it's, um, this is a good time to try to move to the level of black man to get the help that we need. So uh, we have more than lots of that. Yeah, thank you for that. So we know that men are less likely to be vulnerable enough to speak or talk about their mental health um, issues less than women. So why is that? And then how can we change that? I think that the same things that make black men just wonderful people are the same things that lock them in the box. You know, um, black men are seen to be um, reliable, goal-oriented, you know, not complex, so they set out a, a, a purpose and get it done. But those are the same things that keep the individual from seeking help, because there's some, um, there's some, thinking that getting help means you're admitting to yourself that you're no longer all the same. Um, I have a sister who is a psychiatrist. Several years ago, uh, uh, I went to therapy. I've been therapy for years. Uh, and I remember telling her, and she said to me, there's nothing wrong with you that we therapy. Maybe it's, it's not just black men. Maybe it's the black community that is black men to be bulletproof and never made it wow. But if I, if I just consider it more, um, you know, when we, when we speak to, I try to avoid, you know, the loaded words vulnerability, toxic masculinity, all this kind of thing. But when we get down to it, vulnerability really means I recognize that I have a problem and I'm willing to do something about the problem. I'm yeah. not sure, um, you know, it's something that we need to try to do. Do you want to talk about? Oh, absolutely. Um, first, though, I want to start with a couple of statistics, um, just to kind of give you some um, coloring on mental health. So African-American men are 20% more likely to have serious psychological distress than whites. Now, let's think about why we would have more psychological psychological distress than our white counterparts. On a day-to-day -day basis, we have to deal with preconceived notions about our motives. We have to always be cognizant of operating in two worlds, being male and being black. So the way that we have to move within the world is very different. The second stat is among men ages 18 to 44, who have had daily feelings of anxiety and depression, black men were less likely than white men to have used mental health services. So with those two stats, 
My thing is that we have to have a call of action and a call of accountability for ourselves and for every other black brother, uncle, grandfather, son that we have in our community. So if ever there was a time or a season for black men to protect their mental health, that time is now. So I want to give you some of the parameters that we have to operate within, and then you tell me if we need to go seek mental health services or not. In a world that seeks to diminish and extinguish our regalness, because we are kings, we are kings. The saying that the young people have, like, hey king, hey queen, I welcome that statement, because it takes and it empowers them to, to, for them to know that they are more than what society has made them out to be. And the importance in the human chain is imperative that we work on our mental health. We have constant media reminders and agendas that dehumanize us, but, it, but then at the same time, they fetishize us. They fetishize the black man at the same time. And our existence is coupled with presumptions of our guilt because for our white counterparts, it's you're innocent until proven guilty. But for black men, it's you're proven guilty until you're proven innocent. So for us, you know, we already struggle with two marks against this. So we have to be vigilant about protecting our mental health. Nice. So can we just, uh, you know, start over just for a second? I want to allow both of you to give, to give a statement uh, just on the importance of addressing black men's, a black man's mental health. that looks like mine. Um, in private practice that I work in, um, I have a predominantly probably 60% clientele that is of the European persuasion, and the other 40% is African American. Um, in, in dealing with my African American clients, I make sure that they understand there's two things that I will never do to you. One is I will never judge you, and two, I will never leave you wrong, because we have a kindred experience that we've experienced in this land, that we've experienced this land that has led to our mental hardships. So when you say the importance of African-American men seeking therapy, we have to think about it. We are the head of households and the heads of our family. In order for our wife or our kids to follow our lead, we have to make sure that we are physically and mentally well, that we are seeking services that take to help and enhance our well-being. Jay, you want to try that? <laughs> <laughs> but here's what I think. Um, I've done psychiatry practice for 20 years. Um, it won't make any difference what statement that I present tonight, but what's important is what we, what we ground within ourselves. If someone said to you tonight, there is, there is something that is wrong in your, men, in your medical history, you need to make an appointment very soon or it's going to be, what would you do? Um, in my previous life, I, I was an, an administrative disease, so I just fought and fostered the disease and that is really <laughs> But I saw a pamphlet that said how to speak to your thoughts about your depression. And I took it to HR and I said, I would like to get um, other pamphlets for use for how to speak to your thoughts about your hypertension, your diabetes, your cancer, things like that. But for me, what I was hoping to achieve was we cannot separate our mental health from our everyday. Your mental health is what allows you to attend to a hero in your life. Yeah. If you're well balanced in your mental health, you remember to take your medications for diabetes, for hypertension, for asthma, for the things that are likely to kill you much faster than your mental health. So I think that um, we should bring mental health in the same space that we will treat diabetes, cancer, and I hope that helps. Yeah, that helps. <laughs>
<laughs> so I, I want to go back to something that you said, Dami Kweche. You talked about um, some of the most common things that men face. You talk about anxiety, you talk about depression, you talk about suicide. So what are the best resources for men facing those type of, uh, those type of issues um, or struggles? And, and what are the best ways to commence dealing with them? Um, at the beginning, you still have to go out to the You can't. You go okay, so let's, let's try that. How many men here have ever felt anxious? Oh, wow. Gosh, this is stupid. Well, it's not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, I speak to rooms where two people raise their hands, so I have a script for that. But, good. So this is a good thing. So, when you felt anxious, what do you do? It locks in all 50 of the U.S. states with providers, 
in your area that um, specialize in working with men of color who are also men of color. So I think that that is an excellent resource for men to start with. There's also better help. There's um, ZenCare. ZenCare also has um, a part of the website that takes and highlights African American um, male therapists who work with um, who work with men. I think that the first step, though, if we're talking about resources, I want to go back to um, step one. So step one is being able to recognize that there is something that is kind of off kilter or off balance. If there's an extended period in which you're experiencing low mood, if you're experiencing anxiety, which is definitely defined as nervousness times 10, in which it lasts for an extended period of time, in which there's excessive irritability, if there's a change in mood that is recognized by those people, primary support that are closest to you, I think that's the initial first step. Then the second step would be aligning yourself with finding someone that you would be able to confide in. I always encourage people of color to seek out therapists, doctors, dentists, attorneys, psychiatrists of color because there's a kindred spirit there and there's a common experience that you can rely on. Um, so what about just the everyday friend? Like, do you have, can you just have a friend that you talk to? Is that a good step, you know? Yes, you can talk to your friend, but your friend is not a professional. Um, your friend cannot therapize you. Your friend cannot therapize you. Your friend is exact, exactly what they are, a friend. It is best practice to go and seek a professional and professional help by using resources to make sure that you're able to have those issues addressed. Just one point. The concept that people have to look like me to understand what I'm going through, I think it's it's a little bit, you know, on the fence. Um yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Nigeria. I moved to the United States. of what a man is supposed to be. You're supposed to be machismo. 
you're supposed to be uh, guarding of the home and her, which means that there's not many things that are supposed to shake you. And if they are, if they do shake you, then you're supposed to be able to shake those off and continue forward. A lot of that too is that we've been indoctrinated too by like our fathers and our grandfathers. Boy, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Stop that crime. Yeah. Stop that crime for I need something to cry about. Or, or, or we've been told, or we've been told that uh, stop being soft. You know, you know, old Daddy Herman, stop being soft. You know, things that they would say to us, and so we would take and we internalize that as if we dealt with our emotional and mental health, if we dealt with our feelings, then that meant that we were being less than a man. We're being less than a man. So a lot of that is breaking down those institutionalized ways of thinking and structuring your thought process in that the same way that you take your blood pressure medicine, the same way you take your cholesterol medicine, is the same way that you need to take your Xanax. Yeah, yeah. You want to tackle that thing? Is it, is it a societal issue? Is it a you know, public health crisis? What, or, or is it a combination of both? I, I agree that it's a combination of both. Um, but I think we give the society too much power. A, uh, I'm a Christian, I read the Bible. I, I, I like the place where Jesus said to one of the disciples, he said, who do men say that? Mm. And he said something that he said, who do you say that? Um, I think that if we are able to have significant introspection and decide who we are, none of the things society says will really matter. I think I might be wrong. But I think that, you know, to the point of if someone told you we're going to die from X day tomorrow, and the society said, don't do anything about it, would you not do anything about it? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, the society has its demands on the black man. The society has its stereotypes on all of that. But I think that um, the onus is upon us to decide what it is that is important and what we will to play at. Society is not an important thing. Society is important, but not as much as important as the individual perception of yourself. Makes sense, makes sense. So I want to talk about the key stressors and basically the onset of mental health. Like, how do we identify those things? How do we identify the key stressors uh, that create these mental health issues that we experience? I think most people recognize what is normal. If you typically go to bed by 11 p.m. and suddenly you start going to bed by 2 a.m., you can recognize that that's normal. So it's being able to have a heightened awareness as to what's different. You know, Roddy started out with saying, you know, the church is the problem, but, you know, <laughs> part of that is, is also where we, we tend to. Um, dismiss everything and say, you know, God's going to take care of me, it's going to be all right. Yeah, um, God has to take care of you, but God didn't say, God said, that is a problem, that is right to take care of you. Um, more clinically, simple things that when your, your sleep pattern changes, um, when you go from just a little sniff of coming up every night to like pack the bottle every night, when uh, you become more irritable, when uh, you procrastinate, and everything. That's about five to six of something wrong. Okay. You want to give some insight on that? Okay. There's just, a, there's just a couple of other things that I want to kind of bring to light in that area. The first is when you start to find yourself having the inability to focus on tasks. Where if you're at work, and you're sitting in front of your monitor in your cubicle, and your boss is like, hey, um, I asked for that memo an hour ago. Okay, I got it, I got it, Mr. And then you're still sitting there in front of your computer and your monitor with your inability to focus on tasks because your mind is preoccupied with other things, other things and other stresses. Also, it's an internal feeling of being overwhelmed. Over, overwhelmed with everything that's going on. If it's family, if it's finances, if it's social, feeling overwhelmed. So I think we have to look at the inability to focus, 
kind of feeling overwhelmed and that those exist for an extended period of time. There's been many times in which I've been in my office but you know, but that's not it. If it happens over an extended period of time where you go to work and you're overwhelmed with everyday tasks, I think that's that's a key indicator as well. So um, I'm going to talk about substance abuse and the pandemic um, as a casual connection in terms of the key onset, uh, key stress of the onset. Of Let's talk about COVID. <laughs> Let's talk about how COVID has disrupted our life and has left us to pieces of a puzzle that we don't have every last single piece yet to put back together. Um, I want to kind of do a timeline on COVID and kind of walk ourselves through it. It was February of 2020, 2020, February of 2020, and we're all mourning the loss of Kobe Bryant. Then immediately, less than 30 days later, we were on national lockdown in March of 2020. Yeah. With no warning of going from our way of life, because human beings, we are social creatures. We are meant to have interactions with others, but going from being social to going to be into isolation, that was, the, that was the first step. So when we talk about COVID, COVID brought about an array of mental health concerns, especially for black men. Um, COVID brought about financial stressors. We had a job, some of us had a job before COVID, and then when COVID hit, our company said, um, we don't need you anymore. Um, we may have had um, just, just, financial, just financial stressors, changes in employment and the way that the workforce operates. I don't know about you, but this word hybrid came out of nowhere. <laughs> like, it was like we were all going to the office, or working nine to five, and then all of a sudden, it was hybrid. I'm like, what is hybrid? So hybrid came out of nowhere, and it still exists today as a ramification and a long-lasting effect of COVID. And then so, you had your children at home with you. Yeah, so you had your children at home, and then let's, let, let's just be real. I want everyone in here, let's just be real. Let's kind of put our hats down and let's be real. Relationship stressors. You're in the house with the same person 24 hours a day, and there's nowhere else for you to retreat to. Some of us were using the same offices where we're like, okay, I've got to put up a virtual screen, I've got to put up a virtual screen, I'm kicking the kid with one leg. I mean, think about it. You took a vow and said, till death do us part. But sometimes we need to part. Sometimes we need to part. Sometimes we needed a break. But in the middle of COVID, there was nowhere to take a break to because you only had a limited amount of space within your home that you could retreat to. So I want us to kind of look at that. Uh, and then we have to look at the monotony, the monotony of life, how life was during COVID. It was the same routine every day for 365 days a year. I mean, unless you got, okay, your Walmart order came to your doorstep, so you opened your door and you picked that up. But everything else was so monotonous. So we're, we're just beginning to learn the damage that COVID has caused us mentally and psychologically, we're just starting to learn part of the damage that this pandemic has caused us. And I think it's gonna have long lasting ramifications for years to come. Think about those of us who are extremely social pre-COVID. COVID, we went into isolation. Then after COVID, well, I'm gonna call this, we're gonna call it post-COVID. Post-COVID, we're having to relearn how to socialize, how to interact, and how to and how to engage. I'll take myself for example. I'm a very social person. I'm very like engaging, very extroverted. But then after COVID, uh, uh, hey, 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 uh, it's six feet, six feet. You know, because it, we've had to retrain ourselves on how to interact with, with others. So I think that COVID, COVID really did it dirty. There is a study out of McGill University in Canada. It's called a rat pack study. So what we did was put a bunch of rats in um, a confined space, lots of newspapers. Just let them be some cheese here and there. They run around like getting a feed out of the newspaper and like that. And they did a control where they put these rats in a cave and put a black over it, and um, we put um, a drop of the propane in the water and a drop of the water. And around the cave, 
periodically, all day long. And after a while, the rat just went to the, the cocaine water. What was different? The rat was taken out of its regular habitat and put in this place where it felt like it had no control. And the only thing it could control was how much of the cocaine water it had. You ask about um, the causality of uh, substance use in the COVID era. I think there was, like I just said, there was so much that was um, strange, um, inexplicable, and people who already had the propensity to a little bit of substance, just sorry that that's the only thing I can control, and you know, went for it. Um, I'm hoping some of those people are back where there's more control in the other things and not needing to just go to that point now. But um, isolation is one of the um, biggest moving types of substance use because it makes us feel that's all I have and that's all I can do. Okay. All right. Um, let's address uh, masculinity or masculine norms with mental health. So we kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about vulnerability versus masculinity. <laughs> um, I like a more interactive kind of thing. I, I, don't like, I feel like I'm doing a lecture. Um, just what association, what does everyone think is masculine? What? Strength. Strength. Some people find it as a physique, but the actual stack is a physique. The rock. Being the leader. Being the leader. Being the leader. Provider. Provider. Show no fear. Show no fear. All right. That's good. Do we know that among lions, is the lionesses that hunt? <laughs> so the lionesses are the ones that provide the food to sustain the pride. Do we know that among peacocks, the male is gorgeous, 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 but that's just to attract the female to mate for the continuity of the line. The point I'm making is that there is nothing wrong with the things that we say. Fearlessness, folly, being able to read, you know, to say. Nothing is wrong with that. However, what, what I find wrong in the concept of um, an etched in stone masculinity is that if that becomes all of who you are, then if that's taken away, does that mean that you become more ma less masculine? Say you were the provider, if you lose your job, are you less masculine? If we were go with your physique, if you had a stroke and went into rehab, are you less masculine? So I, I think I come back to, you know, my thinking that, and you know, you can feel me after this statement, but, <laughs> I feel that the, the, the power we ascribe to society is a little bit of intellectual laziness that allows us to blame somebody else for uh -huh. what's going on. Uh -huh. I should be able to internalize what I think masculinity is. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm going really to I'm gonna start swinging from every tree. But yes, there, there are some societal viewpoints of masculinity. But the individual is still driven to determine what is most aligned with your psyche and your sense of self. Mm -hmm. One last thing. So if, just take for example, if, the, if, the, um, if one of the attributes was, you know, what provider? Okay, so if I lost my job and my wife was, you know, had a job, should that make me less masculine? 
who say, um, well, I'm going to get unemployment. Okay. But people like me think, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. God is going to take care of me. I'm going to get something better. My point is, we have to be able to create a new story, a more powerful story. Just the fact that an individual is not, um, does not have a face stop immediately, does not take away anything from the um, potential of what they can do. And wasting that in, you know, in this stereotype of who I'm supposed to be and tearing up your whole family is not going to change anything. I don't know that I've answered the question, but I'll let you I look at it as um, in our houses, in all of our homes, we have dishes. We have dishes. And we use the dishes, we use the dishes, we use the dishes, and when a dish is worn or broken, we take and we, we replace it. I think it comes down to seeing like a recipe, what needs to stay included, and then what needs to be discarded. Because if it's old and antiquated and it doesn't work, let's discard it. Now, noting, some of the things that our forefathers passed down to us. Now, brother in the blue suit, I don't know your name, but some of the stuff that our forefathers passed down to us, you know, some of that stuff today on March 23rd, 2023, is the truth. Some of that stuff is the truth, so we have to hold on some of that. But the things that are antiquated and that no longer work in this ever-changing society, those are things we have to, we have to discard. Um, you know, this, this antiquated notion of masculinity as masculinity is, is also equated to what I bring in the house financially. Masculinity is equated to how I can make my woman feel in the bedroom. Masculinity is equated to, is equated to I ask no one for help. Some of these old antiquated thought processes, we have to take and do a restructuring into what's necessary in this environment and in this new age. Now, some of those things from five generations back, are they helpful for us? Yes, they are helpful for us. You know, a man should pull himself up by his bootstrap. Yes, that is, that's a, that's a great, that's a great saying. But there's also, a man should also ask for someone to help him lace up those boots if he doesn't have the strength to pull them up. So there's different things that we have to do and the, and the formula continues to change. It's continuously changing. So we look at vulnerability. I think of vulnerability as being open. And I think of the old school definition of masculinity as being as being closed. I don't need anybody else. I'm an island. I'm a man. I can handle things by myself. No man, there's an old saying, no man is an island. No man is an island. We all need help or assistance at one point from someone or something. And it's us recognizing that we need that help and assistance. And so with mental health, making sure that we take and check that our mental processes are working just like our body, just like an automobile. When an automobile goes flat, when a tire goes flat, you change it. When you need an oil change your automobile, you do it. If you need a day off from work, take a mental health day. If you need to go and, get, uh, and take FMLA, to take a leave from work, to handle some issues, do that. That's not not being masculine. That's taking care of yourself. Because what we want you to do is we want you to still be here for your family. Because if you're absent in mind, you might as well be absent in body. Yeah. You got a question? Uh, yeah, because he brought out a very good point. But there's a, another side to that point is the fact that I need to be doing what he talked about in his household. But what if it's in my household? I got a job. My wife makes more money. She can balance a checkbook in her head. I can't even do it on the capital, but I'm still in charge. That's right. That's right. I think that comes down to individual <laughs> demographics and how a team, how a couple works. A couple is supposed to be a team. Yeah. You recognize her weaknesses and strengths, yeah. and she recognizes your 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 um, strengths. You and your wife are supposed to be Jordan and Pippin. I mean, you're supposed to be able to slam the off. Oh, we got we did that. Ah, oh, oh, we got that. Ah, oh, 750 credit score. Ah, oh, 800 credit score. Yeah. Boom, mortgage done. You're supposed to work as a team, and in order for that to happen, sir, just like you said, 
if your wife has that strength, allow her to do that. Allow her to do that. That doesn't make you any less of a man. That actually makes you more of a man because you're able to recognize and yield to your wife's strengths. And I know that she feels good about that because she feels to be a valued player on the team. Yeah. And, and, and it's, a, it's a common thing in the black community that your wife shouldn't make for one of you as a man. And that's, that's always been a problem. That's never been a problem of mine. <laughs> because every dollar that's brought into your household is for the family. Whether you bring it in, whether she brings it in, whether Curious George brings it in. Every dollar that comes to your household is out towards the bottom line. So that's it. So they got working eight hours a week so you make more money than twice, but you never homework. Yeah. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yes. 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 So how do you deal with the outside world? Look at those outside perceptions as white noise. Nothing else that's inside of, anything outside of my home environment is white noise. That's something, and I don't, I, don't, I don't listen to white noise. The only thing I listen to is the rhythm and the pace of what's going on in my household. I listen to this rhythm and this pace of what's going on in my household. We have a plan, we have an agenda. We have a thing that we want to build. We're building, we're building. We're, if, we're, if we're in a kingdom here and we're building, then we're building a kingdom within our home. And everything outside of our home is nothing but white noise. That's that. That's that. So I have one more question, and then we're going to open up the floor to, I know you guys probably have some questions you want to ask. I want to address uh, issues relating to earlier onset of mental health issues in young black men. Um, and this is purely clinical stuff. Um, when people have a psychotic disorder, you know, they're more disease things, acting out of character, it typically happens early, about what, 18 to 22. Um, in males, in women, it's a little bit later. But I think the greatest thing is they are intervention and if we can recognize this quicker and get on um, the course of treatment, mm -hmm. that happens like that. You know, um, 30 years ago, it used to be like you have to have tried everything and failed before you started on a good stuff that would help. But, you know, that's, that's what we're thinking because if you fail everything, then you've lost everything. If, if I present your brain 20 years later, I'm not sure I've you much. So yeah. I think it's fine that um, the, the warning sign to get connected to help and um, seeking to I think that um, in that realm, I have a saying. It's the earlier the intervention, the greater the retention. Because the earlier the intervention that you have with young males seeking help for their mental health issues, the greater the retention of the coping skills, interventions, modalities, and strategies that they need to help handle this to help. Because I'm, I, you know, I'm a school principal, and I see that there are a lot of young men, black males, who have like anger issues, not having the ability to express themselves. All they know is mad and sad, happy, glad, but they don't know anything else to uh, to to convey what they're really feeling. And so we're seeing that happen a lot in the schools. But parents don't know where to turn. You know, they, they don't know what to do. So you're saying that they need to find intervention programs. Um, in the community. So are there a plethora of intervention programs that are made available, ready available for families who may or may not have um, the financial, uh, you know, the, the money to, to, to take advantage of those? There are community agencies that work with individuals who have Medicaid and Medicare and one of, um, one of the um, PPOs or LMEs for the state of North Carolina. There's also books that you can check out at your local library that teach our young people about how to recognize emotion. Um, as early as two or three years old, there are picture books that have emotion faces that show, that show the affect of what emotions look like so that children can begin to recognize that if my face looks like this or if I, or if I have multiple portions that look like this, then this is, these are the emotions that I have. 
There's a lot of resources. You can check your local YMCA because a lot of them have like groups, like boys groups and girls groups to talk about issues that our children deal with. Yeah. That our children deal with at a very early age. Nice. All right, so those are all the questions that I have. We're gonna open the floor for a question. <laughs> you raise your hand. We're gonna open the floor for questions from you. Um, you can address either gentleman on the stage here. Um, are you guys enjoying the conversation? Yes. 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 Much needed. So there has to be a part two, Brother Tucker, um, of this uh, mind of the matter, this, this black conversation, this mental health conversation for black men. So let's uh, let's get some, uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, we'll start with you again. Uh, Dr. Hammond, you, you touched on the church, yes, sir. and we need more help than that. Help, help pastors to understand their role and breaking that taboo in the church. I think that goes twofold. Um, one, we have to make sure that pastors aren't being prideful and thinking that by referring a parishioner to a mental health um, professional, that it doesn't take away from their pastoral counseling. In fact, that helps is an added benefit because the mental health counseling deals with the mental health aspect while the pastoral counseling deals with the spirit. So, so those two can exist in the same world and they can be interwoven together. So I think part of that is making sure that we deal with pastoral biases and egos. Yeah. And then the second part is to make sure, sure that in churches, there are programs that are established that promote healthy mental health. That there are things like, okay, like open, open talks, open sessions like we're having here yeah. that we take and go back to our faith-based organizations and places of worship and that we establish those in there, that we set those up. So I think a part of that is for us educating the pastors as well. I know that um, for my church back home, where my father is also a deacon, <laughs> my father is also a deacon, there were some, some, some courageous conversations that I had with Pastor Richardson about things that needed to um, happen in that church and for the congregation. Who was very open to it? All right, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Part of that is that we have to establish limits and boundaries within our friendships. And for our friends to recognize that, yes, we can be a sounding ear. I can listen to you, but as far as we're helping to offer solutions and alternatives that are going to help your presenting concern, that's something I can't do. So a part of that is setting limits and boundaries on what you allow to be presented to you in your space. And because you, by profession, you're, you're a counsel, because you're a counsel, I know that kind of is a touch and go, it's a touch and go about setting those limits and boundaries. I think that helps a lot. So I guess, I guess my question would be, um, working in a, an organization that deals with young people, right? And y'all in a profession where people come to you and they bring stuff to you. Uh, by the way, you say a YMCA, but I need to add boys and girls. Boys and girls. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. 
But um, how do you, because I'm big on my, on my team too, about don't don't take that home with you, or how, how do you not internalize that into becoming, you know, my wife is a coach and all that too, I tell her, hey, you gotta have some way of letting that go, right? And not taking on what you hear from others as well, and then that becomes something that you hold on to. How do y'all, because I know y'all talk to people all the time, how do you? It's called self-care. In order to have appropriate self-care, you want to have it in order to, to prevent burnout. Because taking on and hearing people's concerns on a day-to-day -day basis, hour by hour for a therapist, I know for a psychiatrist, is it 15 minutes? <laughs> for those who are in private practice, it's not doctor that can help that. So in order to take and diffuse all of that information and all of that trauma that you that you have been playing during the day, I would say identify outlets. Identify positive outlets that you can use as a release, as a release for 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 letting go of things. Also, you have to be graceful with yourself and know that when you lock that office door and you go home, that doesn't mean that you're doing a disservice those individuals that you serve, you're actually doing a service by leaving it in the office, by leaving in the office that you don't take it home with you, that when you come home, you're emotionally and mentally available to your family, emotionally and mentally available. So self-care, find positive outlets, things that you like, things that you like to do, and be able to leave those issues that day. I want to have a third one. Seek counseling yourself. <laughs> you know, the counselor said he needed counseling, so I think also it's important for us to seek counseling ourselves. I think everybody should get a therapy. Um, <laughs> just, just one other point. You know, when we travel, um, when the region of things is supposed to go to the plane's fraction, uh, one of the things to say is if you lose um, oxygen pressure, make sure you put on your own mask before helping anyone else. So every time you take a step to preserve your own blood mass, you're preserving your ability to help others. Yeah. Another thing is the listening. We, we ought to practice active listening, which is, you know, like um, um, they can say, I'm quick to just say, hey, this is what you should do with it, because that's how my brain works. But I'm training myself to just be quiet, sit in that uncomfortable silence, even when they stop, until they say something else. And sometimes I've said, so what do you want to do about it? And sometimes people have said, no, I just wanted to vent. That we don't have to do anything. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, this is addressed to you, John, um, but earlier we brought up about that outside white folks, right? Especially in our community, a lot of us, obviously, brothers are the same, uh, we look the same. We're also taking leadership roles or being that pillar for our community where that gap may be, whether it's a young child in the church, at work, wherever it may be. How do we not, I don't want to say just take that home with us, but it's hard because you might be, you, you're the head in your own household, but how do you, how do you not let the outside household that you help and guide or help develop not also come home with you? You know what I'm saying? Because in that household, in that in that household, you are a volunteer. In your household, you are a participant. In that household, you are a volunteer. So again, it's by setting those limits and boundaries of what I'm able to do and what I'm able to provide in that role, as opposed to being all in in, in your home. Because if you allow people, if you allow people to use your resources up, they will. Like when I was asking 
we said we got to do that, but like, we have to do it ourselves, but we got to do it with the help of those systems. So you know, they have a view of how masculinity is going. And like I said, they push it on us, and they push it on their son, they push it on their daughters. So I mean, there's a, there's a whole group of people out there that we got to you know, bring into it. So there's lots of courageous conversations that we have to have. And work that we have to do as a family. We're going to do as family by trying to break down some of those views of what masculinity is or what being or, or what being a man is. And with the changing demographics of what we have with society, like brother said right here, with women, there's many women there who are knocking out the part, who are knocking out part in six figures. You know, it's kind of breaking those kind of traditional stereotypes down and restructuring how it is that we have these conversations within our within our home. You have to look at risk versus reward. Okay, what's the reward of my being in this position if I'm muted? If I'm muted and I'm not able to move or operate or work to, the, to my fullest capability, is this the place that I need to be at? So number one, you look at risk versus reward. Number two, you have to walk into the room knowing that if, if I'm qualified and I'm in this space, then I'm supposed to, then I'm supposed to be here. And if I'm going to be here, then I'm going to definitely verbalize and vocalize what it is and what it isn't, what we need and what we don't need that needs to happen in this corporate space. I tell a lot of my black executives that I work with, I have um, retired NFL players, NBA players uh, that fly in to Greensboro for therapy sessions. I'm like, when you're in a room, you have to own the space that you're in. And you have no space that you're in. And you have to acknowledge, they, they have to acknowledge your blackness that it is a, it is it is a cultural it is a cultural difference. But if I'm in this position and I'm in this space, that that means I'm supposed to be here. And if I'm going to be here, I'm going to be heard, and I'm not going to be here. Yeah. Is, it, is it possible that some of the stereotypes is viewed in? I said, is it possible that some of the stereotypes that we're laboring under? that will contribute to it. I'm, I'm asking, I don't know. <laughs> I said, is it possible when you are the one black person in the room of 87 positions, is it possible that the stereotypes that you're laboring under, that you have contributed to the perception of it? Yeah. Um, what do you do that? Without me that moment, what, that moment, what do you do? What do you do? In that moment, what I do, I speak to them the same way I speak to everyone else from that. And I come in, then it becomes their thoughts. They're thinking about it, and they're trying to figure out how to approach it from that standpoint. You address, no, no, in that moment, you address. Um, I had a... <laughs> I had a young Caucasian um, male, he may have been like 17, who I heard him, we were eating at a restaurant. I was eating with my father and my stepmother. And I heard the way he addressed the Caucasian table across from us. And he came to our table and said, what's up? I said, let me tell you something. I said, I'm a 50 year old black man with a 75 year old father and a 72 year old stepmother. I said, when you come to our table and you address us, there is no what's up, it's sir, ma'am. How can I help you? It's addressing it in the moment. You don't let that teachable moment slip away. You address in that teachable moment so that then they recognize, wait a minute. So I'm gonna have to change 
of the natural values toward this individual. That's number one. And number two, it tells them that, listen, I'm not a black man that's convinced I'm not going to convince you. Yes. But there's also a saying that if you stop to throw stones at every dog that walked along the way, you never get away from the one. So I think it's also choosing your path. There are some things that happen in a workplace that I ignore it and I'll wait for another day. There are some things that happen that I decide, no, this, this, this cannot go. So I have a question since you have a microphone. So I have two young sons, 14, well, 14 is going to be 10 in grade. How do I feel, start talking to them about mental health and making sure that they're going to be fine as they get I think part of it is, um, okay, I've practiced for 20 years, I, I, I share personal things. I have a mood disorder that nobody has been able to tell me what it is. It's just some weird way my brain works, some days I'm good, some days I'm not. <laughs> but nobody has told me what it is. But in dealing with my young children, I have a 20 year old son. When they were about six or so, I said, you know, some days that is a great mood. Some days I'm not. And when I'm not, it doesn't mean it's going to last forever. It just means I'm going to step away, maybe sit in the back room, and I'll be back and I'll be fine. I found that to be helpful in the sense that it let me take ownership of the narrative. As opposed to my kids wondering, what's going on with dad? Why is he not coming out of the room? They know that there are some times when I feel that. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think it's being able to um, use personal examples to say, I'm not always on my A game, sometimes you know when I'm not. But um, I'll get that. So you make it personal when you're talking to our son? Say that loud, you gotta say it loud. No problem. You make it personal when we're talking to our son? Personal as in telling my son I have a mood problem, yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I think it's 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 much more authentic if I'm able to say, you know, that here's what's going on. I mean, for instance, if you had a family member who had a seizure disorder, you would say to your family, I have a seizure disorder, I have no control over it. Sometimes my meds work, sometimes I don't. I might fall on, on the floor. These are the things to do to make sure you preserve me and keep me from dying. <laughs> you know, so I, I think it's the same um, kind of way to speak about that. I have a question for that. The city of the black girls in the room, they have heard the devil talk about the money. We 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 all the put on the table. Like uh, Whitman was saying earlier, he talking about what our parents are talking about. It might not work today, but it might work tomorrow. So I don't <coughs> think we're talking about talking to our young son. But most of us in here now in a conversation with our family. Our family. <coughs> so that's where that conversation begins, right? You said you were 72 years old, the parents are 72. Yes, sir. Do y'all have a Yes, sir. We do. We do. Um, I know that my dad dealt with some things from his father. Um, some abandonment and estrangement uh, issues with his dad. So there was an opportunity for us to have some conversations about um, healing, um, reconnection, and, and self-worth. And self-worth kind of having those same kind of conversations. I think that because historically with African-American families, we think about like back in the day, many of us had relatives who had mental health issues and families would, families would either um, put, put, put them in like, okay, you, they're in the bedroom or if they're in the living room where everybody's in the living room sitting down, um, they weren't encouraged to kind of talk. It was kind of, they were kind of placated, kind of told to be quiet. And there was a sense of shame. There was a sense of shame. Not saying that it was actually spoken, but it was felt that there was some kind of sense of shame or whatever with that person's situation. I think 
Part of it is we can't blame people for what they don't know. We can't hold people accountable for what they don't know. But what we can do is if we have the information with our family members, then it's time for us to kind of, we can reach back and have those conversations to kind of help to heal that trauma with our parents and our grandparents, our great aunts and great uncles, and then we can also reach forward in order to prevent any of that trauma or try our best to prevent that trauma from happening to our children and our grandchildren. So it's a, it's a part of kind of like reaching, reaching in the gap, filling in the gap um, for that mental health. Both of us, we have trauma, we think it's part of our life. We, we look at the trauma piece now, and we trauma along, it was all of everyday life. This was known, this was known to happen. Then it's on the road. So long, yep. So it's it's trauma it's and being re-traumatized right. over and over. And it's okay. Because yeah, a lot of us, no, it's okay, it's okay. So a lot of us in this room have been in relationship, and the ladies and men, the had a difference. You know, they don't have we had we had we had the relationship physical That's right. but we don't have it. We don't have it. Because of this all the time. Right? And sometimes it's hard for us too. We have to bring in the aspect that sometimes it's hard for us to break out of the familiar. Sometimes the familiar that we're accustomed to is also the worst thing for us. It's hard for us to break out of break out of the familiar. It's comfortable for us to stay in a space that we are familiar with, even though it's it's traumatic and toxic for us. I think the real strength is once we take a step out of that space and we establish a new space away from that precipitating event and that trigger that continues to traumatize us. And I mean, it, it, it's work. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of generational work that we have to do within African-American families. It's, it's generational and it's systemic because we also have to rewire the way that we look at ourselves because a lot of times we take and we reinforce those thoughts. Um, we take and reinforce those thoughts. True scenario, how many of us in here have seen a brother who looks like us, coming towards us, we feel kind of sketchy, we feel kind of sketchy, and we do something that is not so necessarily overt, like crossing the other side of the street. Mm -hmm. Or maybe or maybe we turn around and, and we pick up our cell phone, nobody's on the other end, but pick your cell phone and act like you're preoccupied in order to not to make eye contact. It's breaking down those types of stereotypes within ourselves, within ourselves, that take to reinforce that doctrine that we are not worthy. We have to rewrite that narrative that you are worthy, that I matter and I value, and I'm valued. Because you're writing that script. A lot of us over the years and young men that come along as a young man, you think just like the man. 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 The human brain is the only one of all species that can be retrained. So if someone could have said the same thing to you for 50 years, at some point, if you choose to, you can retrain your brain, and that's scientific. You know, um, the human brain also has the tendency to just believe the negative things. Because there are people who have been told, my father told me I was going to become a diplomat, I didn't become a diplomat. You know, there are people who have been told, you're going to rule the war, you're going to rule the war, and they did it. So, um, we can retrain for things that have been put on a hat line to make for a better living for our lives. Well, our time is up. One, one more question. One more question. Yes, sir. Uh, my question really spinned off uh, Brother Whitaker's uh, first question. So my question is, uh, just thinking on the macro level, uh, how can health care policy and system research help us create parenting and social skills and interventions for early child care in the cost of profession, efficient, feasible, and effective way? Just <laughs>
Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Can you chop that for us? Okay, basically, uh, someone mentioned mentions this uh, systemic, right? So how can, on a macro level, how can we create policy and systems research that help us create parenting and social interventions for early childhood for cost effective and feasible and efficient ways? We have to we have to run for office. We have to run for office. We have to hold office. We have to join um, um, mental health boards. We have to hold positions of power. Positions of power. We have to have a seat at the table in order to change things on a macro level. Because in order for things, before things change on a micro level, you're right, we have to change it on macro. I say join boards, join, um, join um, run for office. Join boards, run for office. Be part of that um, legislative change that can take and make political and policy changes. Because once we do macro, once we're running and we have a voice at the table and we have a vote and we have a seat, then we change that macro seat we hold will change that micro for that six-year-old, that six-year-old child going through things within their home. The next thing that we have to do is we have to be involved in philanthropic work. We have to raise funds. We need to be involved in philanthropic work that raises funds that are targeted, specifically targeted towards communities of color, communities of brown and black people. Because if you have policy plus funding, policy plus funding equals change. It equals change. Because policy without any kind of funding equals ah! Funding without any type of policy equals nothing. But policy plus funding, that's where real change starts to happen. Positive note, North Carolina just um, completed legislative expansion. You might not have Medicaid, but what happens is that when you have more people insured, it frees up the people who can care for you. That's why you do not have to so.
may not come up with all the solutions in one meeting, but I think more people than not know to say to their boss, I'm not feeling good today, um, I want to go talk to somebody, which is a significant improvement. Well, we certainly hope that you guys um, uh, feel empowered and encouraged to make decisions about your mental health. And we hope that you enjoy the conversation tonight. We plan to do more. At this point, will you please give our panelists a round of applause? <laughs> I certainly, uh, this came about, um, and as I told Dr. Equation and this the other evening when we spoke, this came to my mind when we saw, y'all know who Twitch is, correct? Yeah. All right. So he was a young man that had, seemed like he had everything going on for him. He was on the Ellen DeGeneres show, and he killed himself. And after that happened, I reached out to Brother Hyman here and I said, I want to have this forum here right now. Would you be willing to participate? And he said he would. So the next call was to, I pulled my brother Bats. I said, Brother Bats, this is a conversation I think that we need to have as black men. And he said, I know a perfect gentleman to help us with this situation here. And he got in touch with Dr. Ikwiche and spoke to him. So I personally want to thank Dr. Quinche for being here, uh, Brother Hyman for coming down from RTP to be here with us, um, and I personally want to thank all of you for coming. That's right. Because um, it could have been two of us in here, but it's 53 of us in here. Yeah. because we have beautiful furniture or because we have great technology. They're coming because 
they can get something from us, and we need to make sure that we support those people. So we've been about it. We still have a long ways to go. Uh, but be, me being here has helped me, I think, to be a better president for our college. So I hope they continue to do that. And we're trying to do that for our students, too. So we have mental health resources for our students free of charge to them because we realize that they're going through the grind and the struggle and, and issues themselves. And I also want to give a shout out uh, to my boss, the chairman, Jerry Spruill, because he supports us and what we do, and we appreciate what the board does for us. So let's give it up for him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank They will. They will. You know, when, I, when I when I got that's right. When I got here in 2018, my son was a rising sophomore, and you know, even though you have to go in as a ninth grader into the early college, normally, um, you know, I thought about going to Matt Smith at the, at the um, early college high school on our Charborough campus and saying, "Hey, Matt, you know, can you let my son Jordan get into the early college here?" Well, I found out that they don't allow for sports. And then I started looking around at the students at the early college high school, and there are very few black students, black male students there. And I saw that as an equity issue. So when I realized that we needed to start a second early college high school, one focus on health care, which would be here, when I sat down, I sat down and personally helped write the application to start this Educademy of Health Sciences. And I told my, my peers and counterparts at Edgecombe County Public Schools and elsewhere that we need to allow for sports. Okay, we need to break our thinking that, okay, they can't handle academics and sports at the same time. You know, we, our young men can do amazing things if we allow them and encourage them, right? You know, I went to the School of Science and Math and I played sports too. You know, so we can do it. You know, we just got to give them the resources, the tools, and the encouragement to do those type of things. So we don't have the answers yet. It may not happen the first year, but we're going to figure it out because, of course, it's going to be difficult to, to make sure that they can do sports either here through the early college high school or through another high school, but we're going to figure it out. Okay, so just know that. If you have any other questions about the early college high school, reach out to us. You can certainly reach out to Dr. Bridges the school system or myself. But anyway, you all have a good evening. We appreciate you all. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Uh, before we leave, just one thing I forgot to thank Brother Tavis Harris here. He did a great, great job. Um, he changed the schedule. I called, I had two people in mind to do this. Um, Brother Thomas Barrett before we had a board meeting tonight. And then Brother Harris. Brother Harris changed his schedule for me, for us, to be here tonight. So I certainly want to appreciate him for that. And let me just say this. When I brought this to my fraternity, Cal uh, Alpha Fraternity, the Rocky Mountain Alumni Chapter, and I made this pitch to the brothers about doing this, the brothers jumped on the whole heart and they said, we need to do this. It's, it's something that we need to talk about. We had a young lady that was walking up here tonight wanting to participate in this venue. And myself and Brother Green said, sorry, you can't come in. It's for black men only tonight, OK? So we told her that we wanted to potentially involve her sorority in another event like this for black men and black women. So we may do that in the future. So to, to the chapter of brothers that are here, thank you for the vision of doing this. Again, wholeheartedly thank you, Dr. Koiche, for being here. Brother Hammond for being here, from the bottom of my heart, from uh, Brother Batch, from our fraternity. We thank you for being here. Brother Bill Jones. Yes, sir. When are you planning the next one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> next week. <laughs> yeah, I need some more help. Okay, yeah, you do. Know. <laughs> so we got we had a joke. We had a, we had a joke too coming coming into this meeting. We had about three brothers and we were gonna sit here on the front row. <laughs> Brother Jones was one. <laughs> Brother Mike Pippen was the second. <laughs> the third one ain't here tonight. <laughs> but, brothers, thank you for coming. Please take these tidbits that you received tonight and apply them. And if you need someone, reach out to Dr. Equation. Okay. 
or Brother Hyman. Talk to them. Or someone that you can talk to. Right. It's too much suicide going on within our, within our brothers. Yeah. Yeah. So let's find someone to talk to, whether professionally or personally, that we can talk to. Yeah. Okay. Yes, All you need here tonight, when we have our follow-up session, bring one with you. That's right. Bring one with you when you come back. That's the, that, that's the lead way. Bring one with you. All right? Then we build with this. Before long, whether we're going to be big enough. This room won't be big enough. That's what I mean. It won't be big enough. That's the crowd we're going to have. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank all you young men for coming. I appreciate you. Brother Spruill, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you can close it out in prayer, bro. You can do it right here, bro. Our gracious Father, as we come, we thank you for your presence. For uh, what came out, this came from you. Well, bless these people, gentlemen. Help us to open our hearts and truly accept what we heard. We bless this organization, Lord, that they are trying to impact the community. And this is a good start, even though it was already working. Lord, give us traveling grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 They remodeled. Awesome. Beautiful. 